Welcome to Assembly Calendar. I'm Mike Friesan. With us for our program today, Assemblyman Will Barkley. Will Barkley represents the 120th Assembly District, a district that includes Oswego, Onondaga, and Jefferson counties. We want to thank you folks all throughout the region for joining us. Will Barkley, nice to see you. Good to be here. Just a couple days to go now to this 2015 legislative session. Usually, on any given year, we'd be at this point where, where this is the shut down week of the legislature and all this work, all this activity, hundreds of bills, maybe thousands of bills going to make their way through the system. I don't know. Is that going to happen this year? Everybody seems kind of distracted. Yeah, well, it's kind of interesting. First of all, although we have some big issues facing the state, I don't think we have a lot of big issues, at least for upstate, that we're trying to get pushed through uh, at the end of session. There's a couple New York City bills. The biggest one for them is rent control, which is a big uh, uh, piece of legislation they have to continue on the rent control system they have in New York City and this 421A uh, tax credits for uh, builders of affordable housing in New York City is another continuation that they have to take. Uh, the Democrats in the Assembly want to expand those programs and make them more for instance in 421A bill they want to put prevailing wages in rent control they want this uh, vacancy decon or they don't want to decontrol vacant when the, the apartments come vacant so those are kind of big issues, but really what I imagine, Mike, is we're going to end up just having extensions on those two bills. For upstate, really the big thing that we have to get pushed, there's a lot of stuff we'd like to get done, but realistically whether we're going to get that done this week or not. But I think really our priority in the Senate has been good about putting this out is making sure that the tax cap uh, that we put in place a few years ago becomes a permanent. That 2% uh, that property tax cap. Right, excuse me, property tax cap. Correct. Yeah, I, I mean, that's... You know, a lot of people weren't sure about that and how that was going to work out, but it seems to have been fairly effective. It has been. I mean, we always want to tie that to mandate relief because a lot of the schools and localities, the reason their budgets kept going up and up was because of state mandates coming down on them. Uh, fortunately, the state economy has been improving, so we've been able to give the schools more money to kind of maybe paper over some of the mandate problems they have. So if we go forward, again, the tax cap has worked, I think, effectively. But in an economic downtime, which is inevitably going to happen, uh, we want to make sure that we can get that mandate relief uh, put in. But at the very least, let's get the tax cap, made it, make it permanent so we don't have to come back and renew it every other year. There are options for communities. If they needed to go above the 2%, they can. Right. It's, just, uh, it's just there's ways to, to do that. Uh, but new, it's, it's worth noting that New York State still has the highest property taxes of any state in the nation, too. Isn't that still right? Yeah, I mean, I think what we've done over the last several years is slow the growth of, you know, local spending and school spending um, by doing two things. Obviously, putting the cap in, but also supplying those entities with more state money to help with their spending. Um, so, it's, you're right. It's still, we still got a long ways to go. It's probably st continues to be the number one issue I hear about from constituents is their property taxes. We just got to keep working on these issues and hopefully start rolling these things back or at least slow them down enough that the rate of growth of the economy overtakes, you know, the percentage of the property tax. I used the word at the beginning of the program, distracted, that there's been a lot of distractions during this. And uh, of course, among the things I refer to were the uh, corruptions charges against the assembly speaker at the beginning of the year and the Senate majority leader about midway through the session. Once uh, you've got that kind of changeover in the leadership in the legislature, that, that's just got to kind of serve to slow things down. Somewhere. Yeah, I think it's definitely had a role of kind of freezing any real big issues out there. I mean, there are, these are big. Rent control is a big issue, but it's not really a big issue for upstate. But I think just having new leadership in both houses that has no experience negotiating with the so-called three men in the room, that's one of the problems we have with the three men in the room. Get a new person in there, it can really gum up the works yeah. when you have only three people. That's why it should be throughout the whole legislature. And, including rank and file members in it. But putting that aside, uh, I just I think the fact that you got two new people out of the three, it really is, I think they just kind of want to say, let's be done with this and get out of town. The other concern we have is, as you said, ethics. I mean, I think there is people continuing to look over their shoulders, concerned that uh, the U.S. attorney is going to be investigating the, the, the old back and forth that you might have gotten in politics. You know, we'll help pass this if you help get this pass or not let this pass. I think there's a real concern about too much horse trading because when does that cross the line from having just being general legislative compromise and politics to where it becomes uh, maybe more 
um, nefarious or you know criminal. So uh, I, I'm glad you brought that up because I've heard a couple of your colleagues in the Senate talk about that very issue. That it may be the fear of of uh, uh, the cloud that's hanging over Albany right now is actually preventing some of the normal deal making right. that would go on and has been going on historically at the state capitol for years. Uh, it, it, it may be striking that down because people are scared, well, maybe that could get interpreted as something illegal. And that's, that's kind of a sad indictment. It is, on, it on is sad, other than the fact that's part of the legacy of a three men in the room type of way to govern. Because obviously, you get three men in a the room, they're going to be bartering back and forth. If you had a more transparent system, I think, any involved rank and file members from both the majority and minority, uh, that kind of horse trading probably would go out the window. And even, listen, I don't think we should ever get politics out of politics. It is compromise. It is, you know, offering to do one thing to, and trade for another. That's the whole system of democracy and politics is based on. But if you did it in a transparent matter, manner, then there's no way that a prosecutor or anyone else could accuse you for, you know, self-enrichment or, you know, doing things for reasons other than the public good. Another distraction that uh, appears to be happening right now uh, is the governor. The governor is uh, expected to be using his leadership to maybe negotiate out some of these final legislative issues like rent control and the 421A and all the different things that need yep. to be to be dealt with. He seems to be a little preoccupied right now with the prison break over in Clinton County. I mean, that seems to be getting an awful lot of his attention for better or worse, right or wrong. Uh, and maybe he's not focused uh, as to this final few days of the session? Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, it would be nice to have him up in Albany and trying to provide some leadership. Uh, you know, I think since his first term, he's gotten a little bit off course. He seems to be all over the place. Sometimes he's placating to New York City. Sometimes he's placating to upstate. There's sometimes he's pulled, you know, going against the teachers and pulled a little bit to the right, you would say. Other times with the minimum wage, he's getting pulled to the left. There doesn't seem, as there was in his first term, a real coherent, strategy of what he wants to accomplish going forward in the state and it just seems to be all over the place and then obviously you throw in Dana Mora and the prison break up there I don't know if his travels up there were politically opportune or he really was trying to help the situation I don't want to be cynical maybe he thought he could be helpful going up there uh, but it does seem like you know the attention that is needed from the governor who is for all intents and purposes, the most powerful political person in the state, we need his attention to some of these issues to get them done. Now, saying that, his attention, a lot of these things I don't agree with him on it. For instance, right. as I mentioned, the minimum wage, he's convened this wage board to increase the minimum wage for fast food workers at $15 an hour. I know I've heard from many, many people in my district that just say that's totally unworkable. That's going to cause really economic hardship. Uh, in upstate New York because the margins are so tight that if you increase labor costs by 20, 25 percent, um, well in this case for fast food workers I think it would go up to 60 or 70 percent would be the increase in the wage, uh, simply makes it unaffordable so they'd end up having to lay people off as a result of that. New York City may be a different deal with that but upstate uh, that type of increase is would be continuing an economic blow for upstate New York. It's not my job to uh, categorize the governor as this or that, but one of the things I remember clearly from his first campaign, which, if you folks remember, is coming off the Spitzer-Patterson years here in Albany, when there was a lot of chaos, a lot of confusion as to what was going on w with, uh, w with our elected officials. He's, he was practically going to ride into Albany on a white horse right. and clean this place up, and he was going to be the new sheriff. Right. So for him in his fifth year here to see the Assembly and Senate leadership be charged with corruption, uh, it's doesn't, disappointing, it's like it hasn't it? worked out. It's disappointing. It really is. I mean, the fact is, even though he's from another party, a different party, when he did come in, there was some real excitement that finally... Mike, we have some professional professionalism coming into state government. We a lot of people remembered his father. He was a real professional right. politician right. and knew how to get things done. Right. And it just, just seems like that's kind of faded to some degree. There's no um, overriding policy agenda that he's trying to push through in Albany to benefit the whole state. So the only uh, other thing I, would just, I did want to mention on the... Um, Ethics, you know, one thing that our conference, Republicans in the Assembly have been pushing is for this pension forfeiture. If you're uh, convicted of a crime uh, of abusing your public service, you know, 
i.e., um, or e.g., taking a bribe, uh, you, shouldn't, you should forfeit your uh, public pension. It seems very logical. I think there's been polling throughout the state, uh, something, you know, 70 or 80 percent. I don't know who wouldn't support that. Right. Um, uh, interestingly enough, it seems to be some of my colleagues on the other side of the aisle in the assembly that seem to be dragging their feet on getting it done. There seemed to be at the time for that pension forfeiture, there was going to be a deal in the budget, we're all set to go in the last minute. Uh, assembly majority uh, pulled that out of the budget, and now they continue to try to negotiate, you know, essentially water down this pension forfeiture bill that was agreed upon uh, during the budget time for reasons that seem I, I don't really understand. I think, you know, generally with the pension forfeiture, if you're out there and you get convicted of something that's not related to your job, I think, you know, you can make a claim, all right, maybe you shouldn't forfeit, but geez, with all the corruption and ethical problems we've had here in Albany, this seems like such a no-brainer. I think uh, since, the year, done. since the year 2000, there have been something to the along the lines of 30 state lawmakers who've been charged with crimes connected to their position. Right. And what happens is they go through that process, and for whatever, that means many of them end up in prison. And then you hear the story yeah. that they are still collecting yeah. X amount in their state pension, and people go, "Really? Yeah. How, how does that make any sense?" Right. And that's exactly what you're talking about with this bill here. Is it is it getting support? I, hopefully, we're going to get there. Hopefully, but I don't know. I thought it was a deal during the budget, so you know, there's been some um, groups that have come out opposed to it, uh, mainly um, labor groups that support you know public employee labor groups. In my mind, I don't even have a problem with it. Cut them out. Uh, really, what I think we ought to focus on is the elected officials. This was a whole, you know, the whole um, uh, genesis of this whole thing. As you said, with 30 or so people have been convicted of crimes, and a lot of these people in prison, why in God's name shouldn't they have to forfeit their state pension? It seems, to me, it seems a very logical thing to do. And I bet to most everybody who's watching this program right now, you mentioned uh, the governor and his relationship with the teachers in this state. It has been a difficult relationship to define, uh, but I suppose that's something, too, that is still on the table for discussion here. I don't think it's been here. difficult to define, Mike. It's been negative, negative, <laughs> negative. I mean, I, I don't know if there's any but positive coming out. that's unusual for a Democratic governor to go up against the teachers' unions. Usually right. a Democratic governor and the teachers' unions, they go hand in hand and skip happily down the road together, and that hasn't been the case with yeah, this governor. Yeah, I, I don't know what his motivation is on it. I mean, he does seem to want to blame every kind of educational ill that we have in the state, which we have plenty, uh, on the teachers. And, you know, it just seems like every time he has a shot to give them a kick, he's uh, more than happy to give them uh, a kick. You know, we did it with the teacher evaluation. We've done it with the Common Core. Um, you know, s equitable school funding is something that we've worked for for years down here to get done. It doesn't seem to be a lot of interest from his point uh, of view to do that. So there are a lot of education issues out there, and he seems to f think the main ill with our education system in New York is with the teachers. I know from my area, I really I'm fortunate I have some great schools in my area, and it's really because we have good teachers, good administrators, and obviously parents that are willing to get involved and you know try to help their children. But we have many, many challenges with these school districts, mainly equitable funding. I live in very rural areas, low wealth school districts. They don't have any tax base to uh, raise money out. They really need uh, equitable state funding to come in and help them. And for whatever reason, the governor and others have not been very helpful in that regard. Now, I've got less than a minute here, but it seems as if uh, the legis this legislature is actually ready to push back on the governor about uh, his education policy and how he thinks things need to get done. Would you agree with that? Yeah, I think so. I mean, certainly we push back a little bit with the evaluation system, although in some degrees we uh, punted a little bit to the state education department. This was the evaluation system where the uh, governor wanted 50 percent of the teacher's evaluation to be based on state testing, which simply just not fair because this teacher doesn't have complete control over how a student does on state testing. There's environmental reasons, social economic reasons, school, you know, the school district that they're in, a number of reasons. So the legislature did come back and push a little bit more against him on that and, and punted it over to the state education department. But there's all sorts of issues that we have to continue to push back a little bit on the and, government. And we're going to need another program or another legislative session, entire legislative right. session, to get into it because we're out of time. Will Barkley, thanks for joining thank us you, today. And we want to thank you folks, too. See you for our next Assembly Calendar.